Um, we're going to turn now to Alison Bechtel, who I, I think Alison and I first met 40 years ago uh, when we were both living in Minneapolis. Um, and, you know, if, if, you, if you think back of what Alison Bechtel has done, um, besides swimming next to Stephen uh, in the pool at the Y sometimes, um, you know, she's been transforming an, um, aesthetic boundaries for decades. Her dikes to watch out for that syndicated column was is it, it was genre changing. It was mind blowing. It was extraordinary, and it had a you know a thirty year run. It was amazing, and then Fun Home, you know, uh, which she's going to share some of tonight. You know, Time Magazine named it the best book of two thousand six, and it totally changed all the rules on graphic novels. You know, it was a lot of uh, a, a lot of male voices in that genre of, of graphic novels and. Here comes Allison and she rewrites that. And it's a very complex story. Um, and it also is banned. That was the book that was banned along with uh, Tanya's book, American Library Association. Um, and, uh, you know, it was such a unique piece. And then it was adapted for a Broadway musical. And you think, how can this book work on Broadway? And it was nominated for 12 Tony Awards and it won five Tony Awards. And so to watch um, that process of Allison as an artist move through all these things and continue writing, um, she did it for another beautiful graphic novel about Are You My Mother, uh, which, which I adore as well. So Allison, thank you again for joining us tonight. And I'm thrilled you're going to be reading from or sharing from Fun Home. Allison. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I forgot to unmute myself. I'm so honored to be here with all of these amazing writers. Um, this is really intense, like going in and out of these vivid other <laughs> worlds. Um, I'm gonna read uh, a short passage from my book, Fun Home. Um, uh, Fun Home was the nickname when I was growing up for the family funeral home that my father ran. Um, my dad also taught high school English and spent all of his spare time restoring our old house. And the core of this book is about how when I came out to my family as a lesbian in college, I learned that my father had been having affairs with other men throughout my parents' marriage. Um, this information completely staggered me. I had no idea. But as I started to look back at my life through this new lens, um, it began to appear more and more obvious. But it had been my parents' secret for a long time until I stumbled along and, and exposed it. And it was just a few months after that, that my father was hit by a truck um, in what my mother and I assumed was a suicide. So I'm gonna read a chapter of, a, a part of chapter four from this book. And I have to show you a little, I'm gonna show you pictures while I read. Uh, Okay. In the shadow of young girls in flower. I have suggested that my father killed himself, but it's just as accurate to say that he died gardening. He'd been clearing brush from the yard of an old farmhouse he was planning to restore and had just crossed Route 150 to toss an armload over the bank. The truck driver described my father as jumping backward into the road as if he saw a snake. And who knows, perhaps he did. Of all his domestic inclinations, my father's decided bent for gardening was the most redolent to me of that other more deeply disturbing bent. What kind of man but a sissy could possibly love flowers this much? Our home was an efflorescence of bulbs, buds, and blooms, flowers wild and cultivated, native and imported, flowering vines and trees, silk flowers, glass flowers, needlepoint flowers, flower paintings, and were any of these failed to materialize floral patterns. At Easter, dad would paint goose eggs with twining tea roses. During the ensuing hunt, we would be sure to find a yellow egg and a thatch of daffodils, a lavender egg passing itself off as a crocus. 
and nestled in the crabapple tree, a pink egg, the precise shade of the blossoms that would soon burst forth there. Our games of baseball, already lethargic affairs, would grind to a halt as soon as the ball rolled near a perennial border. There, my father would become lost to us in a reverie of weeding. At the fun home, dad would take a break from his grisly chores to tweak the stiff arrangements delivered by the florist. Ugly as these were, their quick, damp scent masked the odor of formaldehyde. If my father had a favorite flower, it was the lilac, a tragic botanical specimen invariably beginning to fade even before reaching its peak. We stopped for a moment by the fence. Lilac time was nearly over. Some of the trees still thrust aloft in tall purple chandeliers, their tiny balls of blossom. But in many places among their foliage, where only a week before they had still been breaking in waves of fragrant foam, these were now spent and shriveled and discolored, a hollow scum, dry and scentless. That's how Proust describes the lilacs bordering Swan's way in remembrance of things past. My father had begun reading this the year before he died. After the lilac passage, Proust describes Swan's garden in a feat of both literary and horticultural virtuosity that climaxes in the narrator's rapturous communion with the pink blossoms of the hawthorn hedge. Through the hedge, Proust's narrator could see even deeper into Swan's garden. There, surrounded by jasmine, verbena, and pansies, sat a little girl. The young narrator, failing to distinguish the girl from her florid surroundings, instantly fell in love with her. If there was ever a bigger pansy than my father, it was Marcel Proust. Proust would have intense emotional friendships with fashionable women, but it was young, often straight men with whom he fell in love. He would also fictionalize real people in his life by transposing their gender. The narrator's lover, Albertine, for example, is often read as a portrait of Proust's beloved chauffeur slash secretary, Alfred. My father could not afford a chauffeur slash secretary, but he did spring for the occasional yard work assistant slash babysitter. He would cultivate these young men like orchids. I admired their masculine charms myself. Indeed, I had become a connoisseur of masculinity at an early age. I measured my father against the grimy deer hunters at the gas station uptown with their yellow work boots and shorn sheep haircuts. And where he fell short, I stepped in. I counted as an indication of my success, the nickname bestowed on me by my older cousins. No one needed to explain what it meant. It was self-descriptive, cropped, curt, percussive, practically onomatopoeic, at any rate, the opposite of a sissy. And despite the tyrannical sway with which my father held power, it was clear to me that he was still a big sissy. Proust refers to his explicitly homosexual characters as inverts. I've always been fond of this antiquated clinical term. It's precise and insufficient defining the homosexual as a person whose gender expression is at odds with his or her sex. But in the admittedly limited sample comprising my father and me, perhaps it is sufficient. Not only were we inverts, we were inversions of one another. While I was trying to compensate for something unmanly in him, he was attempting to express something feminine through me. 
Shortly after dad died, I was rooting through a box of family photos and came across one I had never seen. It's low contrast and out of focus, but the subject is clearly our yard work assistant slash babysitter. It appears to have been taken on a vacation when I was eight, a trip on which Roy accompanied my father, my brothers and me to the Jersey shore while my mother visited a friend. I remember the hotel room. My brothers and I slept in one adjoining it. The blurriness of the photo gives it an ethereal painterly quality. Roy is gilded with morning seaside light. His hair is an aureole. In fact, the picture is beautiful. But would I be assessing its aesthetic merits so calmly if it were of a 17-year-old girl? Why am I not properly outraged? Perhaps I identify too well with my father's illicit awe. A trace of this seems caught in the photo, just as a trace of Roy has been caught on the light-sensitive paper. The picture was in an envelope labeled family in dad's handwriting, along with other shots from the same trip. The borders of all the photos are printed August 69, but on the one of Roy, dad has carefully blotted out the 69 and two small bullets on either side with a blue magic marker. Why cross out the year and not the month? Why for that matter, leave the photo in the envelope at all? In an act of prestidigitation typical of the way my father juggled his public appearance and private reality, the evidence is simultaneously hidden and revealed. Oh, thank you, Allison. Uh, sure, sure. Now, be, be, pre-COVID, I, I, Fun Home was optioned. It was going to. It looked like it was going to be made into a movie. Is that still moving forward? Do you know. Hey, who, who knows? <laughs> who knows <laughs> what goes on in Hollywood? Um, yeah. I I think it will happen at some point. And t tell me what you're working on right now. I have a new book coming out in um, one month. Oh. <laughs> it is called The Secret to Superhuman Strength. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a graphic memoir. It's all, it's cartoons. Like I usually, that's what I do. Um, and this is a book about kind of, it's kind of a, an exercise memoir. <laughs> I have um, always been someone who loved exercise and the trends and things that I've done have followed pretty much the general cultural exercise trends. So I kind of tell these stories about um, my life in exercise. Well, what, what I love knowing you for these decades now is how long it actually takes you to develop a book. Cause I remember you talking about an exercise book five oh, or six yeah. years ago. <laughs> so. I am so slow. This book took me like eight years. Uh, my, I, I mean, in my defense, it takes a long time to draw things. I have to write it. Then I have to like sketch it all out and draw it. It's crazy. It's like, you know, it's like a monk illuminating a manuscript. Well, it's great. It's great. I don't know if you saw Jennifer said from the library, another one for uh, a new book for our library. So 